New year, new teleprompter. And can nuclear propulsion, as seen on The Expanse, become a reality? Today we'll find out. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hello again and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host, Sean Kenny, and this is the first episode of 2021. We weren't just sitting around eating rum cake during our hiatus. Thanks to those who've donated, we've been able to upgrade our set to include a better camera and a teleprompter so you can see my pretty face. But enough about me, let's talk about nukes. A binge watch of The Expanse inspired today's episode. Don't worry, I won't be giving away any spoilers. For those who haven't seen it, it's a sci-fi epic that discusses a future and where mankind has developed nuclear propulsion to the point where we can colonize and develop the solar system. The way they tackle physics on the show is pretty ingenious and not something covered in sci-fi very often. I highly recommend you watch if you're interested in the subject matter of this channel. During my binge watch, I realized that while we had previously discussed nuclear energy as it relates to Mars colonies, I hadn't discussed how it could be used to actually get us to Mars and beyond. We're rectifying the situation. Now, before I get started, I need to emphasize the title of this episode is Nuclear Fission in Space. I know the drive system in the Expanse is fusion-based, and yes, I do plan on covering fusion-based applications in future episodes. The reason I'm covering fission-based application is that unlike fusion, the concepts I'm going to cover either have been worked on in the past or are practical enough that they can be applied near term. So with all that said and done, let's get to it. So to start things off, we have NERVA, which stands for Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application. This was a program that the U.S. government worked on for almost two decades. The Atomic Energy Commission initially started work on it through Los Alamos National Labs as part of Project Rover. The initial aim was to provide a nuclear-powered upper stage for nuclear ICBMs. But when NASA was formed in the late 1950s, the program was continued as a civilian project and was reoriented to producing a nuclear-powered upper stage for the Saturn V rocket. You see, the way a conventional rocket works is you have your initial fuel, which could be liquid hydrogen, for example, and an oxidizer, such as liquid O2. Then when you achieve combustion, you propel the rocket by way of thrust. Though this process is very well understood, it is the most inefficient way to achieve propulsion in space, especially if we plan on going to far-flung places like Mars and beyond. The issue is when you plan for journeys across space, you need to account for every gram of mass, Not just the ship or the payload, but also the fuel you carry to take you there. In a nuclear thermal rocket like NERVA, you don't need to carry an oxidizer because you don't achieve thrust by combustion. Instead, nuclear fission superheats the hydrogen fuel and expels it through the nozzle as exhaust thrust. This is a far more efficient way to go about traveling through space. For one, you don't need to carry an oxidizer, which in turn cuts down on the mass required to carry out the mission. Second, the rocket has a higher specific impulse compared to conventional rockets. Traditionally, chemical rockets have an ISP of about 450 seconds, while the ISP of a nuclear thermal rocket like NERVA runs at about 900 seconds, which is twice as much. At that rate, you can cut down your transit to a planet like Mars to about half the time, or if getting there fast isn't that important to you, you can carry twice as much payload with the same amount of fuel. It's important to understand that this was not a paper reactor. NASA built and tested this in the Nevada desert during the Apollo program. They demonstrated that nuclear thermal rocket engines were a feasible and reliable tool for space exploration. And at the end of 1968, the engine met the requirements for a human mission to Mars. NERVA engines were built and tested as much as possible with flight certified components and the engine was deemed ready for integration into a spacecraft, but unfortunately it never flew into space. Though it had bipartisan support in Congress, the program was shut down ironically by the same president who shut down the molten salt reactor experiment. Now, NERVA had some drawbacks. It required a reactor to heat fluids and required a great deal of fissile material. But in the years that followed, other designs were looked into. One such design was the nuclear saltwater rocket. 
Proposed by Dr. Robert Zubrin of the Mars Society, the rocket would be fueled by salts of plutonium or 20% enriched uranium, and the solution would be contained in a bundle of pipes coated in boron carbide for neutron absorption. The main difference is that critical mass would not be achieved until the solution passed through the reaction chamber and expelled out the nozzle as exhaust. Additionally, the salt water could be funneled out in such a way that the neutrons wouldn't travel upstream and ruin the astronauts' day. So in short, the design had some inherent safety benefits, but they don't stop there. The rocket can achieve much higher thrust and a much higher exhaust velocity than that of an NTR like NERVA. Best estimates are around 10,000 seconds ISP and an exhaust velocity between 60 and 70 kilometers per second. This is 25 times more efficient than traditional chemical rockets. And depending on how you design the ship, if you could increase a bit more, you could reach Jupiter in a matter of months. NASA had a design called Orion, which used multiple nuclear explosions to push a pusher plate to achieve thrust. And Zubrin's design shares some similarities in principle. However, the nuclear saltwater rocket was designed to achieve continuous thrust by comparison to pulse thrust. And because of the way fission is achieved by different means, it can be done on a much smaller scale. The initial study started with estimates operating at 20% uranium enrichment. However, it would be plausible to use another design that would be capable of achieving much higher exhaust velocities. By using 2,700 tons of highly enriched uranium salts in water, you could theoretically propel a 300-ton spacecraft to up to 3.6% of the speed of light. That is 6,700 miles per second. At those speeds, it might be possible to send a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri in about 120 years. In the mid-1990s, NASA had a proposal for unmanned space travel called Project Prometheus. Now, unlike nuclear thermal rocket concepts I mentioned before, this was a proposal to power a spaceship and all the critical systems using a nuclear fission reactor. Thrust would be driven electrically using an ion drive, and the amount of energy available would be considerable compared to smaller spacecrafts using RTGs. The proposal was considered to be used for the proposed Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter mission to explore the Jovian moons like Callisto, Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Because the amount of available power was in the 200 kilowatt range, you could power better long-range communications, various instruments, and a very powerful science radar. You could analyze the moons with incredible detail and provide scientists at home with enough data to keep them busy for decades. Unfortunately, this program lost funding around 2003. So I've covered a handful of proposals here, and though they all have their own merits, the one I'm really attached to is none of them. Don't get me wrong, from a physics and engineering standpoint, these are far more superior to chemical rockets when operating in space. However, in terms of the use of fissile material for propulsion, you aren't exactly getting the best bang for your buck. If you have access to highly enriched materials, you are better off using them for terrestrial applications. Having a nuclear fission reactor in space that requires shielding for the crew and all these superlative systems requires taking up additional mass that could be utilized for the mission. So is there an alternative? Yes. In 2004, Dr. Robert Wingley of the University of Washington proposed a concept for the mag beam propulsion system. Rather than having a nuclear reactor on your spaceship, it would be placed in an orbital array around a planet or moon. This array would shoot an ionized beam of plasma towards a passing spacecraft. The craft would not contain any engines for propulsion aside from some thrusters for maneuvering. Instead, primary thrust would be achieved by repelling said beam using a small electromagnetic field. Once you arrive at the destination, you would decelerate by repelling another beam at a station orbiting around the planet. Because the craft is being pushed and not doing all the work, you can use a larger, more powerful reactor in a stationary configuration. You can increase power while also cutting down on the mass of your spacecraft. The only limiting factor is how much power is available at said station. However, based on Wingley's report, you could achieve a round trip from Earth to Mars in about 90 days with an 11-day stopover on the Red Planet. 
Compared to other Mars plans, that is considerably faster than the two and a half year missions proposed in the past. And with much shorter round trips for exploration and the ability to carry extra provisions, you can cut down on most of the risks associated with deep space exploration. Things like radiation exposure due to cosmic rays and muscle and bone loss due to zero-g flight can be significantly reduced. The concept of beam propulsion holds a great deal of merit for several reasons. Other scientists like Jeffrey Landis have considered this approach for interstellar exploration. With modifications and an ample amount of power, you can accelerate to relativistic velocities, and instead of having another station at the target destination, you can decelerate by dragging across the stellar winds by way of a magnetic sail. In the near term with in-orbit refueling and in-situ resource utilization on planets like Mars, we may not need nuclear propulsion for exploration of the inner solar system, but it's nice to know that there are nuclear propulsion options for deep space exploration. Regardless of how we do it, so long as we decide to venture forth, humanity will have a bright future ahead. For now, here on Earth, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hey, thank you so much for watching. We'd love it if you like, subscribe, and left a comment. This all tells YouTube to push our content and helps us educate more people. Have you done that? Good. Now I have a confession to make. This isn't actually a podcast. It's a deception, a ploy, a ruse to get my producer Jessica married. Sean, what are you doing? You see, now that I've gathered a bunch of educated men ages 20 to 40 onto one platform and have their attention, I would like you to put forth your efforts into winning my fair producer's hand. May the best man Sean, win. Sean, I thought we talked about this.